Today I'm not going to talk about, largely not going to talk about any of what you just mentioned, um, but I'm really giving a very basic introduction to fMRI. Now, let me briefly ask you, who here in the audience has worked with fMRI data before? Okay, it's a bit more than I expected, so I tried to sprinkle in some more advanced topics because I was told to keep it to a, a basic non-expert audience. Um, I hope at the end those that are not familiar with fMRI know something about it, those that are familiar know more about it, and those that are already experts. We had an entertaining lecture maybe. Good. Functional neuroanatomy. This is in quite some contrast to what you've probably heard over the first couple of days where it was mainly about the structural organization of the brain, identifying areas. Now the key question in functional neuroanatomy is which neuromechanisms, which areas, which terrains facilitate mental capacities? And this has a quite long tradition and I really like to have this slide up at the beginning, not to mock it, but rather to point out that even centuries ago, many of the basic ideas of today's neuroscience were already there. They were just, let's say, molded in a framework that seems really odd to us nowadays. But if you think about it, what do we already see here? What is mainstream in today's systems neuroscience? It's A, the segregation of the brain into distinct areas. And that is something that is really crucial to our understanding of the brain. Different parts of the brain do different things. And in fact, it's the only organ in the whole body that is organized in such a way. Second, you can define borders between these. And third, they should relate to phenotypes. That is, people are different from each other in terms of basically everything. Cognitive capacity, personality traits, skills, and so on. And one of the fundamental ideas that is already found in these kind of maps, and that is still massively present up to today, in fact, much more nowadays with the advantage of big imaging data sets, is the idea that inter-individual variability in brain Neurobiology should relate to inter-individual variability in phenotypes. And so this is really why I like to start out with the phrenology to see that a lot of the, to, to point out that a lot of the things that we talk about nowadays and that are now cutting edge science actually conceptually are substantially older than our methods and approaches. Now, Things have evolved since then. And those of you that have been dealing with neuroanatomy before probably know these kind of figures from their anatomy textbooks. Now the question is, where do we actually know that from? How do we know that the occipital lobe is related to vision? You can't see it. If you've done the dissection course, if you see the brain in your hand, you couldn't tell which part is doing vision and which, which part is doing motor. And in fact, also when you look under a microscope, you, apart from some very special cases, could not tell whether this part is involved in hearing or this part is involved in memory or in higher cognitive functions. So how do we know what the different parts of the brains are doing? Well, there are at least two fundamental roads. And the historically older is lesion symptom mapping. So you learn something about what a part of the brain is doing by observing a brain that can not do something anymore. The famous case, obviously, the initial case was Monsieur Tan, who was described by, by Paul Broca um, almost 150 years ago now. And the idea has still remained the same up to today. So you see patients with a particular deficit ideally a fairly isolated deficit, and then look at where is the brain damaged. And you compare that to other people that also have their brain damaged, but have this particular function preserved. <coughs> and this is an example for how that could look like today. So here you see the lesion overlap in a series of stroke patients with apraxia, 
And here you see the lesion overlap in stroke patients without a praxia. And then you can do a statistical test to see which voxels, which locations in the brain are more likely to be damaged if you have a praxia than if you do not have it. What's the advantage and I think the critical role of lesion symptom mapping up to today? The critical aspect is that it can show necessity. If that region is intact and you can do a function, and if that lesion uh, region is not intact anymore and you cannot do that function anymore, then we have a very strong evidence that this region is causally necessary for the particular function. That's the good, what's the bad? Well, there are at least two or three main drawbacks of lesion symptom mapping. One is the brain is a living organ and it's plastic, it reorganizes and in particular does so once it has been damaged. So the lesions change over time from the initial day of stroke up to like two months later. The actual physical lesion in the brain looks different and also the behavioral deficit changes from the uh, time of stroke until a couple of months later. So what is the real function in that sense? The other big drawback of lesion symptom mapping is that it obviously depends on natural occurring lesions. And ideally, we would want these lesions to occur randomly and independently random. And unfortunately, the brain doesn't do that. Why doesn't it do that? Because there's a vascular tree and there are interdependencies and there are territories and there are just some sites that are more likely to be hit by stroke or not. So take home from the very first part, we should not underestimate lesion symptom mapping as a tool to really learn something about necessity, but it's severely limited both by the plasticity of the brain and by the fact that lesions do occur in systematic and often unfortunate patterns. So the other way to look at functional specialization in the brain, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the hour, is to use functional neuroimaging. There are various methods to watch the brain at work, as it's always advertised. Uh, but by far the most common nowadays, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about, is functional magnetic resonance imaging. The other technique that had historically a bigger impact was PET, positron emission tomography, but this uses radioactive uh, labels and hence is and never made it into population imaging, maybe for understandable reasons. Now this is a picture of a standard MRI scanner and the setup for those that are not familiar in an fMRI study looks roughly like this. So the subject is lying in the scanner with the head in the magnet and into, into the coil system and then we usually have some sort of input, usually visual input because it's the easiest, could also be auditory or tactile and in most experiments you have some sort of a response, for example button press. Now I'll come back to that later but it's worthwhile to remember that fMRI all of fMRI that uses this basic setup really treats the brain as a rule-based input-output system. You are being told pre, uh, beforehand what are you, is your task. You go in, get a stimulus, have to remember that particular task that you're doing, process the stimulus according to the rules of that task, and then provide your response. This is very powerful to probe this kind of functioning, but I think it al already highlights where task-based neuroimaging has its biggest problem, and that is being natural. Your life, apart from very peculiar circumstances, is not having a rule, and then you're seeing 400 stimuli, and you always have to press left if you see a cross, and right if you see a, a square. This is not what you do in everyday life. And this is actually not what our brain has evolved to do. 
Now let's look a little bit deeper in what happens actually. So the, what we usually do in MRI imaging is, or what we can do, is to collect two sorts of images. One is structural MRI. It's usually T1-weighted, most often MPRH sequences. <laughs> they have a high resolution and show anatomical details, but they can't tell you anything about brain function. And the other is functional images, usually T2 star-weighted, most commonly EPI sequences. They have a fairly low spatial resolution. Standard on most, let's say, three Tesla scanners is something between two and three millimeter per voxel. Now, if you have a three by three by three millimeter cube, that's quite a lot of brain that's in there. But that's the resolution limit already on the physical side. They are acquired at a fairly fast rate, let's say one every two seconds. And they are sensitive to the bold effect. And I'm coming back to that in the next slide. The critical thing is, because they are acquired relatively fast, we can actually acquire a whole series, a time series, of these functional images. Now, how are these functional images, the values you see in there, linked to brain function? How does the contrast arise? The underlying trick that was described in the early 90s is actually not a trick at all, but rather a biophysical phenomenon. It's the so-called Bolt effect, blood oxygen level dependent effect. What is happening? In short, when you recruit a particular brain region, so if you give a task that is processed by a particular region, then this region increases activity. I think that's fairly obvious. Now what happens due to this increased activity is that there's a release of vasodilatory substances. Now what happens if you release vasodilatory substances? The arterials open up, so the blood flow increases. Does that make sense up to here? Okay, brain activity changes blood flow. Now, as we all know, the blood that comes through the arterials has fairly high oxygen concentration. And once it leaves the capillary bed, it has a very, fairly low ratio of, of um, very low oxygen concentration. So due to this increase in blood flow, we have a change in the oxygenated to desoxygenated hemoglobin ratio. And the interesting thing is that this ratio goes up or down. It actually goes up. This is a bit counterintuitive if you think, for example, at muscular physiology. If you are exercising, if you're running, your, quick, your muscles quickly go into an anaerobic mode. So basically, there's more oxygen extracted, and the ratio between oxygenated and desoxygenated drops. In the brain, the whole thing is a little bit diff uh, diff different because actually the oxygen extraction fraction doesn't really change. The brain does not consume more oxygen. Now comes the trick question, why does it increase blood flow? If you can get along with the same oxygen you already have, why do you need more blood flow? It's mainly like a sewer, transport away metabolism. You just have an increased flow, you have an increased diffusion into the blood, and it basically looks to clean out the local environment. And that's important because otherwise effects like uh, excited toxicity would be much more complicated. So you need these regulatory mechanisms. So in the end, what happens as the whole cascade is you have neuronal activation that leads to a release of vasodilatory substances, nitric oxide in particular, that causes an increased inflow in blood that changes the oxygenated to desoxygenated hemoglobin ratio and in particular, since these two have different magnetic properties, it changes the MRI signal. So, in the end, when there's more activity in the brain, these voxels become brighter. It's actually very nice. It's a long, long and winded road to get there, but in the end, more activity means brighter images. Now, we acquire these images as I said, at a rate of about two seconds, and we do so in, let's say, two millimeter cubes. So in, in total, you have a few hundred thousand voxels in the brain. 
Now, how do we get from this information onto information about where in the brain something happens? To do so, we need quite a bit of pre-processing. And I will not go into all of the details, but just really in the next slide summarize the key steps. First is we need to correct for motion between scans. No matter how still you try to lie in the MRI scanner, your head is always going to move, be moving a bit. And now comes the critical point. We acquire one image at a time. And in one image, there every, uh, a voxel is in a particular location of the brain. Now what we cannot do is analyze brain locations. But rather, on the next image, we again just have our image matrix, and there's a brain somewhere in there. Now, if you have moved, then the same point in the data matrix now is a different part of the brain. And imagine if you then move a lot in the scan, then basically one particular point in your 4D data matrix just represents different parts of the brain all the time. So what we need to do is to realign the images such that the same point on our 3D grid always is the same point in brain space. Skip this. The next critical point is spatial normalization. Why? Every brain looks different. But still, in the end, we want to make things comparable. We want to do a cross-subject analysis. And the only way we can do that is by bringing the brains into a standard reference space. So we first of all, within each subject's data, need to make sure that the same point refers to the same brain location across time. And then later, for the different subjects we analyze, we need to make sure that the same point refers to the same brain location across subjects. Everything else that you can do in pre-processing is more of an optional optimization. But the two critical aspects are motion correction and spatial normalization. And then usually also some form of a spatial blurring to increase the signal to noise ratio. So once we've done that, this is what we have. We have a time series which can, which actually is a, a 4D matrix because we have three dimensions in the brain and then time as the fourth dimension. And across that 4D time series, the same location in the grid always refers to the same brain location within subject, across scans, but also across subjects. And then we can, for a particular location, extract the signal. Now, the fundamental approach in task fMRI is mass univariate. It's a mass univariate statistics which we later interpret spatially. What does that mean? So assume we have 200,000 individual locations, individual points on that grid. What you do is for each and every one independently, for each location independently, you test whether there is a relationship between the signal at that location and whatever you're interested in. And you don't care about all the other voxels, or patterns, or anything. But for every voxel, you say, is the signal I measure in that voxel related to whatever I'm interested in? And then later, you actually project that back onto the physical space of the brain. And then you try to see spatial patterns. I'll show you that in a bit. Now, when we do that, we have a little bit of a problem. And the thing is, remember, what are we measuring? We are measuring not neuronal activity. What we are actually measuring is the change in MRI signal due to the change in oxy desoxy hb ratio, due to the change in blood flow, due to the increase in uh, vasodilatory release, due to the increase in brain activity. So there are a lot of things happening. And importantly, there are a lot of things happening that are not electrical or electrochemical, as in the brain, but they're actually physical. They need the vasodilators need to be released, and they need to go to the endothelium cells. The endothelium cells need to relax. That's a physical thing that takes some time. And then the blood needs to flow in. So all of that means 
that while brain activity is obviously happening at a millisecond level, the hemodynamic effects, the actual things that we can see with fMRI, they are not. But rather, if you have a neural activity, let's say, that is shaded here in gray, that's the time when that brain region was active, then the actual response that we measure looks something like this. It happens later, so about six to nine seconds later, and it lasts longer than the actual neuronal event of interest. So, what we cannot do is basically directly relate our experimental timing to brain activity. When we say this is the time when the subject saw a stimulus, and if we look at exactly that time in the brain, we're not going to see anything. But rather we're going to have to compare the observed brain activity to what we would expect if there was a response. And this is exactly what happens. So we take that hemodynamic response function and our input function, our stimulus, so we know here is when the stimulus happened. We can evolve that with the bold response and then we look for where we would expect activity given the timing of our stimulus and given the bold response. And then we can actually do this kind of image analysis. So if you ask subjects in the scanner to move their right hand and do exactly what I just described, what we do statistically is, for each individual location in the brain, test if the measured activity time course reflects what we would expect if that particular voxel indeed follows the prediction from our model. And what we then do is to impose a statistical threshold, let's say p less than 0.5 corrected for multiple comparisons, and then, as you see here, we plot those locations where the test was significant back onto the brain. And these images, in some way, are highly misleading. They're good. I mean, they're a lot of the basis of my work. But then also, in some way, highly misleading because we did not test for whether there was an activation that looked like this. This is nothing we can make an inference about but rather we test every individual point and then just label them as active or not. And it's only due to the fact that the data itself is spatially smooth that we usually get these nice and, I have to admit, very suggestive looking clusters that seem like a compact uh, region of brain activity. This is something that emerges from the data and the analysis, but it's actually not what we directly analyzed, but rather, as I said, we analyze every point individually. Still, you can actually see now, for example, if you move the right hand, you have a strong activation on the left motor cortex in the hand area, as one would expect. And if you move the left hand, then you see a contralateral response again. We want to understand what the brain is doing. So far, so good. Um, the thing is, what is brain function? What is a function? Well, when we usually come from the cognitive, from the psychology side, then usually what we would describe as functions is kind of like more abstract things, like personality, intelligence, manipulation, these kind of things. But this is not really what we can measure the fMRI response to. But rather, we have these kind of functions, and then we have to think about some task probing this function. And ideally, in a perfect world, you would have a one-to-one -one mapping that a particular function is probed by one and only one task, which also only recruits that particular function. In the real world, and then obviously there's a particular brain activity pattern underlying it. Well, in the real world, that's unfortunately not as easy. Still, let's stick with it. Let's pretend a function of our brain is working memory. I think those of you that are coming from a more cognitive uh, background, you wouldn't disagree that working memory is one of the core cognitive functions. Well, so what we did is, uh, for example, a working memory, 
meta-analysis of about 200 functional neuroimaging studies. When you ask about 200 study, about 200 studies, where in the brain is there robust activation, consistent activation by working memory tasks? So which are the areas that across many different studies over and over get activated by working memory experiments? We can be quite happy. A nice bilateral frontal parietal network, IPS, prefrontal cortex, premotor, and so on. So are these the neurocorrelates of working memory? Now, we can ask, what is working memory? And you can go to a psychological literature and find tons of theories about working memory. OK, and then you ask 10 psychologists, so how do you measure working memory? Now, not, forget about your theory. Now, I have a subject here I want to put in the scanner. What should I give them to do? And you could give an answer like, oh, Sternberg task, a very well-established task. We use that a lot in our lab. So subjects get a series of, let's say, letters, then this little break. Was that part of the set that you memorized? OK, who would disagree that this is a working memory task? You're all happy with it, right? Ask another cognitive psychologist. They're usually very talkative. Say, oh, wait. We always use the NBAC task, and it works really well. So what you do is to give the subjects, to show them a series of letters, a new letter every two seconds, and they should then just press a button if the letter is the same as the previous one. Is that a working memory task? Anybody disagreeing? No. So we are all happy that this is a working memory task, and that's a working memory task as well. Do you think they actually, is it the same thing that the subjects are doing? No, it's, it's substantially different. Now this really illustrates the difference between a task and a function. So as a function, let's say we have work memory, but then we have two particular tasks. Say the Sternberg task and the Enbeck task. Now what is the Sternberg task doing? The Sternberg task basically asks the subjects to memorize something, break, recall. Right? So it's a very linear sequence. So we would assume that this maps primarily onto some sort of memory buffer. Again, what that is, let's not discuss it. But there seems to be some function in the brain that's probably this memory buffer thing. Now what's the NBAC? You get an A, you get a B, now you have to check, is that the same as before? No. Now you get it again an A, Wait, what do you have to do? When you get the B, you also have to remember that, right? So every stimulus is the probe for the previous one, but it's also the memorandum for the next one. So you basically have to use that as a check, make a judgment on it, but then store it in memory. It's the same item. So basically, in contrast to the Sternberg task, this NBAC task has a much higher component that's related to manipulation. Sternberg is just in, keep, out, whereas NBAC is in, out, but also now move it around and then out. So this little toy example already illustrates what I think is one of the biggest conundrums in, in cognitive science, that we want to know something about brain functions, cognitive functions, but we can only measure them by using tasks. And there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, what we see is that also this relationship is not so trivial on the brain level. So what you he see here is differences in brain activity depending on whether subjects do an Enberg or a Sternberg task. And you see quite nicely a much stronger activation, in particular here in the frontal cortex, in these sort of higher cognitive centers, for the Enberg task which actually reflects exactly what I was just talking about, this higher need for manipulation and, and doing something with the material. On the other hand, and luckily, no, not surprisingly maybe, we also have a lot of overlap. So there are a lot of regions that are activated both by the NBAC and the Sternberg task. So what we have up to here is that we have different functions. And these functions here, we cannot really address them. They are largely theoretical. Of course, there's theories, and there's tests, and there's evidence, and so on. 
but we don't know what these actual functions are in the brain. We don't know how the cognitive repertoire on the neurobiological side is separated. We have a lot of ideas from cognitive psychology and we are glad we have that. But it doesn't need to mean that there is something like memory or manipulation. It could be that the brain is dealing with things in a completely different manner. And then we have a particular task that recruits some, some of these things. Now, but at least, hopefully, the activity pattern is directly related to the task, right? Yeah. It would be easy if it would be so. The problem is, if you do an NBAC test, I gave you an example. So there you saw letters. Now you go to another lab, say, well, what's your version of the NBAC task? Oh, we always use shapes. It's much better than letters. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, ask your, your friend doing a PhD in a social psychology lab. Uh, no, no, you have to use faces. It's, it's, it's actually much more salient and much more relevant. That's what, that's what our brain has been made for. Mm -hmm. And so on. OK, OK, now let's, let's just decide on one stimulus. Uh, so how often do you represent them? Uh, not faster than one every two seconds. Ah, wait, the, everybody can do that. You have to challenge the brain, like one per second is a much better way of doing things. No, 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 no. if you, if you want to investigate also elderly subjects, two and a half to three seconds gives you much more robust signal. Mm, OK, and white or black background. So what I'm getting at is that it's always very convenient, and if you actually look at the literature and, and listen at conferences, People always, tr let's say, trend to pretend that a task is a task. There is, we use the NBAC task. The problem is there is no such thing as the NBAC task. There's literally like hundreds of parameters that are smaller, bigger, centered, off-center. So many things you can change. It's still an NBAC task. Everybody would just say, oh, we did an NBAC task and found that. Does it have an effect on the brain? Well. I think by now you should probably know that it does. Here's one example. Uh, just NBAC task comparing verbal versus spatial material. So is that the same letter versus is the letter in the same location across trials? And maybe not surprisingly, again, you see differences. Obviously, you also see a lot of convergence as well. So what does that get us? Basically. What we have is a situation that we, at some point, want to learn something about brain functions. We can only learn about brain functions by, or functional representations, by doing tasks. We have to give the subject something to do. And there are a lot of different tasks, and then there are a lot of different ways of implementing these tasks. And what we would think of is that a particular version of the task so if everything is the same, then if the number of subjects is sufficient so that you do not have a big problem with inter-individual variability, then we should at some point have consistent activations. Something should always be in the same spot. If you do exactly the same thing, then minding some noise, we should recruit the same brain regions. But that's not a direct link to a particular task, and there's not a direct link to a particular function. So this is why I'm always a bit skeptical when it comes to using this kind of models from cognitive psychology. And any cognitive psychologist, they're really very happy to acknowledge that they don't care about the brain. A real cognitive psychologist, not a cognitive neuroscientist, a cognitive imaging person. A real cognitive psychologist would be very happy to say, I don't care whether that's in the brain or whether that's in your stomach. It's just a module. It's a box and an arrow. And if I'm, I'm happy, if I can manipulate the task such that something I predict from that model happens. There is no neurobiological whatsoever in, in, in these models. And I think it's one of the big problems we're actually facing. A Mid, bit less now because people have given up on trying to find the correlates for these kind of notes. But for a long time, it was a big discussion. And it just doesn't fit, long answer short. So can we map that onto the brain? I would be very careful and, and rather think we were what we should, what we need to think about is what are the actual functions of the brain? What are the natural segregation? Now switching gears a little bit, 
Um, because I was, no, first questions. Any questions on that? The whole I think there was a lot of stuff in a fairly short time. There's a paper published in TICS, Trends of Cognitive Science, this year uh, with Sarah Janot as the first author, where we actually have some detailed theoretical uh, description of all of that. So I can really advise that as a, as a good uh, read over the fall now. Summer has already gone. OK, so any, any questions, any comments on, on this idea? I have a very basic question, I guess. Because I always felt that fMRI is kind of abstract, and there is a lot of knobs and switches that you can turn and press. Um, but right now, I feel like you're giving me a lot more arguments for this opinion. What's your take on that? I think there are, there are at least two aspects to be separated. Um, one is, well, I think we couldn't call it questionable research practices, although it sounds a little bit too accusing to me. The problem is, is it runs a bit deeper. fMRI studies are not cheap. So there's a lot of logistics, a lot of expenses. So basically, compared to, let's say, a quick behavioral experiment in 20 subjects, if you acquired 40 subjects with an hour-long fMRI, you have a much higher threshold in saying, ah, doesn't, that didn't work, forget it. So I think there is a unhealthy pressure for every fMRI study to yield some result. If you compare that with what's been called the analytical flexibility, there are so many ways you can analyze your data, that certainly has yielded its fair share of literature that you wouldn't necessarily want to trust. But this is unrelated to this problem here. But the good thing is, there's actually a solution to both of that. Why? Because I think from both of the individual problems, the analytical flexibility, and this is actually called the experimental flexibility. And both of them produce a lot of noise. There are going to be activations somewhere that never replicate. <coughs> Bottom line, don't trust any single fMRI study. The good thing is, there are thousands, there are tens of thousands of studies. So what we can do now is to actually look at what are robust convergent findings. And this is why I'm so excited about the field of fMRI meta-analysis. So let's stick with working memory. It's always my favorite example because everybody has a rough idea of what I mean by working memory. There are probably hundreds of working memory studies. Some are very good, some are not so good, and in some, the students really massaged the data to death until they found something to find, to report. There are some that use this task, some that use that task, and so on. Now, if we want to find out something about working memory as such, we should not be the judges and say, that's a good study, that's a bad study, and I trust that study, which I identified as the best. But th because that wouldn't get us around this problem of, of experimental flexibility. But rather say, let's put all of them together hundreds of studies, where in the brain is there convergent evidence? Which are the locations that are active above chunks across many different fMRI experiments on that particular topic? And this, I think, has a very high potential to consolidate what is undoubtedly a very messy literature. So kind of bypassing the problem of, of having an experimental design that's correct, and um, what's your opinion, and does your team focus a lot on resting state data and try to extrapolate? That actually comes in two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about resting state as well. Not at, at ultimate length. I mean, that could in itself be a multi-day course. I mean, like more like Danilo's approach to pure <coughs> data-driven stuff, essentially. Do you do any of that? Or? I do some of that, but I also do have quite some reservations. Well, the thing is, my biggest problem with purely data-driven work is that we, by far, do not have enough subjects. So in the end, we have about, let's say, 100,000 voxels in the brain. Let's say be rather low dimensional. Maybe let's just go with 500 brain regions. If you look at the number of connections you can compute between them, then basically even a big study with 1,000 subjects is not a lot. 
Right? We always have the problem that we have much more data per subject than we have actual subjects. So what, and, and um, I think this is really one of the biggest problems with the data-driven work. On top of that, um, why do we want to throw away all of the knowledge about the brain? I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm saying fusing the two. So essentially using that's the one that's that's not coming in. <laughs> You know, the, the, the thing is, about, I'm just going to finish the idea. So uh, there's a lot of talk in the field about data-driven methods, and it's, it's a big hype on data-driven yeah. now. Um, what I find always very bizarre, if you had conferences that are quite strongly data-driven, is the amount of people that uh, either truly or deliberately uh, pretend not to know anything about the brain. Yeah, so let's do it all data-driven. Let the data sort itself out. I have no idea about the brain. Motor cortex could be up here. I don't know. Let the data sort itself out. Why? We do have. No, it, it still does, but it shouldn't be. I mean, well, I'm not, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but I, I'm saying this kind of pseudo cockiness from the data driven side is not helping anybody. I mean, I, I understand it's really on vogue at the moment, and I'm a big fan of data driven methods. I do a lot of data driven stuff. But you should not throw out 100-something years of neuroscience knowledge out of the window. We should be open to new insights if, with a data-driven method, you find something that's completely at odds with what you know up to now. It's an interesting lead to follow. But it's not like data-driven methods will all of a sudden sort out the brain uh, in a way that hasn't happened for the last 100 years. So I think it's, it's an overreaction at the moment. And it's certainly an overreaction that was rooted in what I just said. People got frustrated with kind of being stuck. And, um, and certainly also the, the, the composition of the field has changed. There are more people now coming into the field that have no background in psychology, medicine, biology, but come more from the data science, computer science perspective. And I love these people. We have a lot of them in our institute. But they should also learn to appreciate what's in the brain and not say, well, whatever 100 something years of neuroscience have done is irrelevant. Um, the data will tell me the truth. In the, I could give actually a, um, a nice lecture that I gave at, at OHBM this year. It was the, the main focus was, let's bridge data science and brain mapping. But I unfortunately had another topic for today. It would have been interesting. OK, let's go a bit more on to rest. Oh, uh, more questions on that topic. Not a question, really, but I mean, I agree that meta-analysis is better than single study in terms of interpreting particular brain activities, but it's still biased by the fact that, you know, plausible results are easier to publish, and there's publication bias that's... Yeah, there. Well, that's actually... <laughs> you know what's funny? In some way, neuroimaging has the least positive publication bias. It has the highest publication bias, but least positive. And the reason is, it's so logistically expensive to do fMRI studies. So basically, um, the vast majority of people will not give up until the paper is published somewhere. Yeah, so that means there's tons of analytical... Right, but there's no hidden literature. There's a very small hidden literature. Like there are very few studies that never get published. So in the end, if somebody squeezes and massages the data until something really odd happens, it is going to be published. But then if you look at the meta-analysis, that's just going to be non-consistent. The bigger worry for meta-analysis is would be, uh, would be unpublished studies. So if there was a systematic bias that some studies just do not get published at all, then we have a problem. But that seems not the case in fMRI, because there are enough journals, and it's expensive enough, so that every, I, I think close to every fMRI pub study gets published at some point somewhere. I'm not saying that's good, but it's definitely helpful from the side of meta-analysis, because you don't have a big gray literature. But basically everything at some point gets into some journal. OK, let's briefly talk a bit about resting state connectivity. So the key aspect here is that the brain is never really at rest. So when we talk about task fMRI, you usually have activation and you have rest. 
and in rest, the subject will just lie there. Now, this is what happens if a subject is just lying there. The brain is constantly active. Why? Well, because just try to think about nothing. You can't think about nothing. Your brain is not built that way. So what happens when you just lay down in the scanner, are being told to keep your eyes open, I'm going to measure you. Why are you lying there? Did I actually lock my car? No, I think I did. Ah, it's scratching me here. Oh, I should move. I really shouldn't move. Ah, I need to go shopping afterwards. Damn. Uh, what do I need, actually? Hey. So there's a con Oh, wait, wait. We have visi uh, visitors tonight. So, the so there is a constant train of thought, an endogenously con uh, um, controlled train of thought that's happening while you're in the sc uh, scanner thinking about nothing, nothing in particular. Now, the critical thing for all of the resting state world is that whatever you think about when you're lying there, when you remember something, when you plan something, when you do whatever, you're using the same brain networks as if you were explicitly asked to do so. And why is that? Because we don't have any other way of doing it. We can only recall a shopping list by a particular set of areas. And whether you're explicitly asked in a test to recall that list or whether you're doing that in the scanner because you go shopping afterwards, right? So the key idea is that this kind of unstructured endogenous thought really in a random way goes through all of the different systems that your brain has memory, social, some motor, don't move, uh, again memory, some here and there. So basically it just meanders through your mental space. And if you do that for a while, let's say 10 seconds or so, you get a fairly good um, sampling of the different networks that the brain has. Now what we can not do is analyze what happened at a particular time point. So we cannot look for activations in the same way as we did for task MRI. Why? Because we don't know when something happened. So rather what we're doing mainly in resting state analysis is to look at connectivity. So how closely coupled are two particular regions in the brain? And the idea is if they are strongly linked because they're being recruited together, then their time course will be very similar. And I'll show you an example here. So that's the time series we can extract from the left primary motor cortex and that's the time series in green that we can extract from the right primary motor cortex. What you see here is that they're quite well correlated. So brain regions that are in the same network, they trend to show correlated signal fluctuations at rest. And this is resting state connectivity. We can also look the other way, other brain regions that are anti-correlated, so brain regions that are less active when, the, 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 when region A is more active, that region becomes less active and vice versa, so going up and down. They can also be interpreted as a, as a coordinated activity, but obviously in an, uh, in an anti-sense. So the basic idea behind resting state analysis is you put subjects in the scanner, don't give them a particular task, record in the same way as you would if there were a task using this EPI sequences. And because you cannot look at time points, you actually look at correlations between different brain regions to see whether they go up and down together independently or in an anti-correlated fashion. And you can do that, and that's the critical thing, per subject, in a relatively short measurement, 10 minutes, where you don't need a lot of active participation from the subject. So the big advantage of resting state is that it yields some insight into functional network architecture on the individual level in a relatively simple manner. Now I just want to present one uh, example to show also that you can use uh, that to study interdividual differences and also relate it back to task activation data. So this is the idea I just outlined. 
So you have a lot big and heterogeneous literature on working memory, and then you can do a meta-analysis. So what you see here on the left are all the locations that have been reported in the literature for working memory experiments. And you see basically any part of the brain has been activated by working memory studies. That shouldn't surprise anybody anymore, given what I said earlier. Now you model the spatial uncertainty and convert that into a density function, you get something like this. And if you then apply a statistical analysis, you see those regions that were convert, uh, consistent across chunks. So it's not about strengths, it's about consistency. These were the regions that had an above chunks consistency across studies. Now what you can do is then basically define nodes of the network based by the peaks of this map. Yeah, so you say, okay, here's a peak, and here, 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 and so on. And these are the nodes of my functional network. Why do we need to do the peaks? Remember what is displayed there is the strength of convergence. So the peak is that location where the previous literature agreed most strongly upon. So we use that, and then we can actually extract on the individual level the resting state network within this particular network. So each of these lines here, each of these edges, is a functional connectivity between a pair of nodes for that one individual subject. And the critical thing is, if you uh, don't count the nodes here, let's just pretend they're like 20 or so. Um, so basically, if you have about 20 nodes, you actually go from hundreds and hundreds of thousands of possible connections to a set of a few hundred. Right? If you have 20 uh, nodes, then you end up with about, uh, about 200 connections, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so it's, it's actually all of a sudden a very limited number. And in particular, it's a number that compares fairly well to the number of subjects you can have. Yeah? Because 200, 300 subjects is something we can achieve in imaging studies. If you look at the whole connectome, 20 million connections, we won't have an imaging study soon with 20 million participants. That's the one advantage. We actually reduce our feature space, but we do so in a biological manner. So we say we only look at the connectivity between regions that are involved in working memory functions. So what we have is this kind of individual connectome, per, uh, individual network per subject, and we can then represent that in, in such manner. So we have a lot of subjects, and these are our different connections. Right? So yeah, that's our, our uh, data matrix when we want to deal with connectivity data. And what we can do now is try, for example, to predict individual phenotypes from that data. So what we do here is to set apart one part of our data, leave them out, and then train our model on the big part here, and then evaluate, see whether we can predict this last group. And as a proof of concept, what we did here is to look, don't worry if you can't read that, it will become easier on the next slide, is to look at a range of different brain networks things from emotion regulation to memory, action control, empathy, and so on. So a lot of different brain networks. And what we asked is, does the connectivity within that particular network allow to differentiate patients with schizophrenia from healthy controls? <coughs> and we also asked, does connectivity patterns in that network allow to differentiate Parkinson's patients from healthy controls? And if we do that, we get actually a very nice proof of concept, not only that the prediction accuracy is actually better if you use small networks than if you use the whole brain, <coughs> counterintuitive, but in fact quite trivial, because you actually have a much better ratio of subjects to features. Yeah. You're talking about prediction, what kind of algorithm did you use? Uh, that, one, that particular study was support vector machines. Um, we're actually playing with a, with a bunch of things. Um, I don't like support vector machines, I'm very, very honest. But they trend to always give the best results. But we, 
what we've seen, uh, so what, what we actually mainly use is, is support vector machines, relevance vector machines, and different versions of the elastic net. And now across a lot of different application examples, I can probably talk two hours about just different application examples. What we see is that support vector machines are rarely the best, but they are consistently among the better. So the thing is, other techniques, lasso, elastic net, relevance vector machines, in some cases, they're doing great, much better than everything else. And in other cases, they fail gracefully. And I have no really good idea why that is. It's because the feature weights overlap, so there's a lot of correlation between the different weights of the... Oh, but they, they should all be, be uh, capable of handling that. An elastic net, a relevance vector machine, they should all be able to handle that. But they don't, because elastic net does it better than SV. Well, in theory, they... Right, but th that's, th that's what I mean. If you look at the different algorithms, they all have different penalties. I mean, even in the, within the elastic net. So you're saying there's like no one thing that's like no one size fits all kind of algorithm, essentially. <laughs> Apart from maybe support vector machines. And I think that's why they are so popular. Nobody likes support vector machines. I've never met anybody who is really a strong uh, supporter of support vector machines. Why is so much of the literature on support vector machines? They seem to be the closest to a one size fits all. If you look at, let's say, 20 different applications, it's unlikely that support vector machine is the best anywhere. But it's always going to be among the top two or three. And we've I tell you, we ran a bunch because we really, at some point, we start to get intrigued by that phenomena and try to do a lot of different things. And always run a real an, an array of algorithms, like support vector machines, relevance vector, lasso, elastic net, rich. We tried cl uh, trees with Gaussian process regression. What the heck? It was always um, support vector machines were always close to the top. And I think that's why. That's why it's so, so prevalent. It's not good, but it's also never bad. But if you have any idea of why that is, I'm happy to discuss it further. I, I have no explanation for that. Okay, so uh, just to, because I'm seeing we have to somewhat watch the time. So what you see is actually a very nice proof of concept um, for that this idea of defining brain networks by task and then doing individual analysis of the resting state actually works quite nicely. So you see, for example, for Parkinson's disease, memory and motor networks are very well uh, distinctive. So looking at the motor network, you can identify a Parkinson's patient from a control patient, uh, con health control quite well. But it's much worse in differentiating a schizophrenia patient from health controls. On the other hand, if you look at emotional processing or empathy, they're very good in differentiating schizophrenia from controls. but quite bad in differentiating Parkinson's patient from controls. So we see, although we are just at the beginning here, that there's a huge potential in this kind of integration between task imaging, identify robust functional networks, and then resting state imaging that allows to really look at individual prediction. Another example for the same concept, a cognitive action control network and the default mode network. Now, which of the two networks is better in, um, in predicting individual cognitive scores? Well, that's the prediction of individual working memory capacity from the cognitive network, and that's the prediction of individual capacity from the default mode network. So we do have, I would say, initial evidence that we can and probably should link the localizing aspect of task imaging and this kind of multivariate network-based approach that we can do with resting state. And together, they hopefully give us more insight into brain organization and individual variability. I'm going to close with a little wrap-up on task and resting state fMRI. Uh, it's important to um, reiterate they are based on the same phenomena. Both use the bold effect. In task imaging, we have experimental control over time and content. And I've discussed why that is problematic, because you can choose too much. Uh, we usually analyze the evoked activity between conditions, so the within subject, between condition design. 
and we do it's dominated by localizing univariate methods. Resting state analysis, in turn, uh, we're looking at an endogenously controlled mind-wandering state. We usually investigate correlated activity, network behavior, functional connectivity, and it's dominated by multivariate network analysis. And with that, I hope I stuck to my time and thank you for your attention.